All right, everyone, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Feel free to grab some pizza and something to drink. Um, my name is Michael Cruz. I am the International Directions Advisor in the Language Institute. So I work with students studying languages and international area studies, and I try to help them figure out how to integrate that with their other career interests. So if you have questions along those lines, feel free to come and see me. I have some business cards up at the front here. Um, so just a um, quick word about the format. We're going to have a short um, presentation uh, from our three panelists, and then we'll have some question and answers uh, at the end. So if you have questions, just hold them until the end, and, um, and we can sort of have a um, free for all then. Um, so um, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Feldman. Um, who's joining us from Los Angeles. Um, Steve graduated in 1993 with a DBA in marketing and management and spent seven years in Japan after gra graduating from UW, uh, where he started his own Japanese trading company, doing business throughout the US and Asia. Steve is fluent in Japanese and has been working with Japan and other parts of Asia for 20 years and is currently the president of Big East Incorporated in Los Angeles. So please join me in welcoming Steve Feldman. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with uh, you tonight. Um, like Michael introduced, my name is Steve Feldman. I'm originally from Paramus, New Jersey. I was at the University of Wisconsin from 1998, uh, 1988 to 1993, and I have a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Marketing and Management. Um, part of the way, as many of you may, uh, I was also a board member at the uh, University of Wisconsin Band very much uh, less fun football times for the university than today, so I'm jealous of that too. Um, I, as a business student, I'm sure it's still the same today as it was back when I was there, but there are certain requirements to uh, attend to the business school. And as a uh, freshman and a sophomore preparing to enter the School of Business, um, one of the classes that uh, we were required to take, or one of the choices that I, I chose for uh, uh, that requirement was the comparative politics class. Uh, a professor named Stephen Anderson was teaching it at the time. And uh, in that class, we talked about the politics and the cultures of several different countries, uh, including Japan. And really, up until that time, I, I really didn't know much about Japan. I really didn't have much interest in things Japanese. I, I really never thought about it, other than you know, being a business major. But that class and, uh, kind of fired up an interest in the Japanese culture. We talked about the work ethic. At that time, we talked about uh, Japan as number one. There was a book that was being published. And the Pacific century, the 21st century, was going to be the Pacific century. So things like that that we talked about in that politics class made me think that combining my, uh, my business skills with a foreign language such as Japanese would be really uh, important. Um, and Japan was very successful at that time, so it's definitely something that I wanted to learn more about. So from uh, from that class, um, uh, and during my junior year, I, I got the chance to uh, start my first Japanese language class at the University of Wisconsin. Professor McLoin, uh, Professor Mori, uh, she was uh, a teaching assistant at that time, uh, she's there, and uh, Professor Mura as well were my uh, senseis or teachers at that time, and um, thanks to them, um, uh, I've come a long way with Japanese since then. So I wasn't a very good student at first. It was difficult uh, uh, learning Japanese. And it was difficult learning Japanese for me in a classroom-only setting. Uh, as good as the teachers were, at the lecture halls were, were scary places for me. A lot of the kids uh, in that class had been to Japan. They had homestays uh, experience. They had some uh, uh, exchange student experience. Uh, I didn't, and uh, that was intimidating for me. But um, I, I, made, I made friends quickly with a lot of Japanese exchange students at the University of Wisconsin. And there, there's, here's a point I'll come back to later, but the University of Wisconsin being as international as it is, there's so many students from all over the world. If you reach out, you'll find other students uh, from Japan and other places who want to learn English. If you're willing to help them and they're willing to help you. And I made a great group of friends and we spent a lot of time um, out doing things uh, like karaoke at that time, or karaoke as, as, as it's commonly pronounced, uh, and spending time with the students outside of what I was studying in the classroom became a real 
real big benefit for me. And I think for the Japanese language, certainly anybody learning it, it's a big plus to not only learn what you're learning in the classroom, but to get out and have common, friendly relationships with people your same age. And the reason for that is the different levels of, uh, of speaking in Japanese, but then who you're speaking to and what environment you're in. In the classroom, you're going to learn the basis, and it was great that I learned basic, formal Japanese in class. Uh, but I quickly found out that that formal Japanese is great for business and great for other things, but your friends don't like hanging out with you very long when you keep talking to them formally all the time. And uh, mm -hmm. spending time with people, friends, same age, people like that made, uh, made it easier to learn more of a less formal Japanese as well as the formal Japanese we're learning in class. Um, I also had an opportunity of living in the uh, Towers dormitory at that time um, to become a coordinator in the dorm for foreign international students. And uh, that gave me an opportunity to interact with not only uh, Japanese, but other Asian and, and European students as well. And it was from that point, I think, still as a student that I started developing connections that till today, 20 some odd years later, still benefit me quite, quite a bit. So connections, connections, keep the connections that you need is really a, an important point I think I want to relay to everybody. My first uh, trip to Japan was during my uh, end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year. I was still a, a language student, I was still a business student, but I, one of those exchange students I met owned a, uh, his family owned a huge chicken farm in rural Japan. Uh, and I, I, I'm from New York and New Jersey. I, I've never been on a chicken farm, but uh, I wanted to immerse myself in Japanese culture. I took off to Japan and I spent three months on a chicken farm, working there, living with somebody who worked at the farm. And, and you know, that was the first time that I think my language, I started to really understand Japanese, being immersed in the culture there, living in a rural part where there was no other English speakers. Even if people wanted to speak English with me, I, I didn't want to speak English back with them. I wanted to work on my Japanese. And although I spoke, uh, taught English to some of the people to make some extra money, which is a great thing for anybody who goes to Japan to earn some extra uh, revenue, I, um, I, I, I learned it was really beneficial, not only language-wise, culture-wise, um, lots of lessons-wise, uh, things that you learn outside of a language. Uh, you learn through a language, you learn culture, and you learn other things. And that experience on, that, on the chicken farm that summer really set the, the course for the, the rest of my life. Because uh, as I came back from that trip and spent my last year studying Japanese, I entered a contest that I don't know if it still exists now. Uh, it's called the Japanese Speech Language Contest. Uh, it's based in Chicago, or was based in Chicago, and was sponsored by the embassies, I believe, and the Chamber of Commerce of the United States and Japan. And uh, I won that contest uh, in 1993, speaking about my experience on the chicken farm, which uh, uh, I think was quite a memorable speech for many people there that day. Um, as many people are talking about, a lot more boring kind of business type or cultural Jews. Uh, I got up in a, in a chicken uh, 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 farm uniform and a weird hat plastic boots and I gave my speech about that experience. And that, uh, that was the opening door right there for, for me for a job offers. Uh, um, and many Japanese companies are in Chicago, around Madison and other places, and they uh, searched me out and I found, I got an offer from a job, uh, from a company in Chicago at that time, a Japanese company, who offered me to work in their Japanese office utilizing my Japanese skills. Uh, uh, but I uh, turned that offer down and I, I Respectfully did so, asking them if they had an office uh, in Japan or, or another company in Japan that I could uh, work for. I, I wanted to go to Japan and, and better my language and my cultural knowledge. And that connection led to another connection that got me my first job in Japan. And that was back in the days, uh, now we take for granted, but back in the days of, of recordable CDs when we were moving from cassette up to CD and stuff. And video CD, uh, video, the compressing video to fit onto a CD format. This was a, uh, I entered a company in Japan that allowed me now to put me in the seat right away as the only partner in the company to run their international sales. And that technology was booming all over the world, and, and, and my territory was Asia. And uh, they moved me there, they got me an apartment, and I started traveling all over the world, particularly Asia, selling um, CDR recordable CD technology at that time. Some of the things that were beneficial for me speaking Japanese that probably, uh, I don't think I would have gotten that same job or that same experience if I didn't speak the language and 
speak the language well enough or show a dedication to want to keep learning more of the language uh, than if not to speak any language at all. And, and what I mean is that back in those days, and things have changed now a bunch, but there were a lot of foreigners and, uh, back then. There, there were, were, but there wasn't lots of numbers of foreigners as there are today. So simple things in Japan at that time, such as renting an apartment. Renting an apartment was not something I could just walk into a place and say, hey, here, I got money in my pocket, I want to rent an apartment. No way, no how. Half of the people wanted guarantors. They wanted to know that I not only spoke the language, but culturally understood uh, the differences between living in Japan and the United States and living in a, that type of uh, uh, housing development as opposed to, or, and it took probably four or five, six different apartments, uh, but finally I was able to meet the owner of one and speak to them and convince them that I was uh, respectful enough and understanding of the Japanese language enough to uh, uh, to let them uh, rent me that apartment with uh, my company as a guarantor. Um, and that was great and, and it put me right in the Japanese city in a rural, more rural part of uh, outside of Tokyo and um, I lived there and worked for that company for about five years, um, well sorry, for about uh, uh, two and a half years at that, at that company. Some of the things I, I did, besides traveling throughout Asia, there was a lot of translating technical manuals, a new, a new technology uh, coming out of Japan, everything's written in Japanese. So translating things, uh, translating meetings between engineers in the United States and in Japan. And those were a lot of challenging things. If you go in, as good as you speak a language, when you start speaking about things that in your own language you're uncomfortable talking about, whether it be technology or whether it be Something you're not comfortable with. It's even harder now when you've got to sit in a meeting and you're under pressure and you're translating things that you don't understand. Japanese is a little important. There's a lot of English words used in Japanese. Uh, a lot of them are technological words, but how to use them um, is something that's hard. So, um, you know, it, it, to my advice to people in the future who will be translating and doing things like that in Japan. Try to find out what you're going to be putting uh, to translate for. Try to research your subject. Try to learn some of the words that are going to come up at you because uh, it's an uncomfortable situation when you're sitting in a, in, a, in a meeting and you're the reason things are not getting done. Um, on the other hand, those Japanese and traveling around Asia was a very interesting thing for me. And, and what was interesting about that was, um, uh, as an American, then we go places. We, we think everybody's going to speak English, or everybody's going to try to speak English with us. And you know that was the case throughout Asia. A lot of people spoke English in that. But it was funny um, when I would go to Korea, Taiwan, uh, countries that didn't necessarily have great historical relationships with Japan. But there was enough people there doing business, or enough people who had learned Japanese that when I went to other, to those couple of countries, particularly Hong Kong as well, sometimes it was easier to speak Japanese with that person, whether they were Korean or, or Chinese or Taiwanese. And, and it was uh, sometimes to speak English. It also put them on a level playing field with me. It wasn't me speaking perfect English and them trying to understand what I was saying. We were both speaking Japanese. And needless to say, in, in a lot of social settings, uh, uh, it raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, a lot of people would look and not understand why a Korean guy was speaking with a white guy in Japanese. It, it just it kind of confused a lot of people. But it was. It was something that I think my customers appreciated, and, and they were able to work with me on a more even level, and, and it was a big help. Um, language in Japan, I learned quickly, was not just reading, writing, speaking, uh, and those types of things. There's so much unspoken language in, in Japan, and, and other parts of, of the world as well, I would imagine. There, there's so many things uh, in the Japanese culture that aren't said, but are still related. And, and my point is that anybody who's going to learn, learning from a textbook is one thing, but you've got to get out, you've got to make friends, you've got to get into different settings where different types of language are used or when non-language communication is used. But outside of doing that, reading the books, I think that was on our end. Um, OK, so back to Steve. So I'll continue. Uh, the, um, again, uh, I think I was talking about 
the importance of getting out of the classroom, doing other things. Which, like for me, my way to learn Japanese uh, was through music. I, I like songs, I like singing, I like karaoke. Um, and the beauty of music in helping learn Japanese was that you are reading it, you are hearing it, you are you are listening, you are listening to it, you're reading it, and you're enunciating, you're speaking it. And I think the combination of all those things really helps you learn uh, a language. And, and a language like Japanese, particularly because you're dealing with kanji and other character systems that aren't familiar with you. So outside of kind of combining all those things together while you're listening to a song in karaoke and the, and the script is at the bottom of the page you read through, through your, your, it's, it's helping you memorize things. It's not just music. I think you know other people today. A lot of people are into affirmation, not like the manga or to other Japanese cultural things. I find something that you like find Japanese versions of it. I mean, today with YouTube and you know, all other sites, so much information. There are get things. Take find Japanese movies that have subtitles or English movies that have Japanese subtitles on them. Another great way. You're hearing the English. You're reading Japanese subtitle, and you're now memorizing. Oh, in that kind of situation. I would translate that. And it's, it, for me, it was a big help. I would think for anybody else there, it would be uh, a big help as well. Um, and, uh, um, see. Anyway, moving on to my first work experience, I, I, I did that in Japan for a couple of years with that company. It was a great uh, lesson for me. I learned about hierarchy in, in the Japanese business stuff, like environment, uh, stuff inside companies you learn about. Not talking as much. Um, and, and you learn about how to be a little bit more. Um, um, you learn how to be a little more patient. But, um, I think as young people, or me myself, coming out of college, I, I was ready to express my opinion and so eager to, to be a participant in in the Japanese company that I quickly learned that that wasn't necessarily culturally the, the thing to do. Maybe shutting up and listening a little bit more. Maybe. Um, uh, listening more and, 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 and offering my opinions less, especially when you're in a hierarchy of structures within a Japanese company where your first year uh, person, you're, you're very low on the totem pole. And I, I learned a lot of things. And that, again, those are things you're only going to learn by being immersed in, in, in a culture. Um, after a couple years of that company, I felt comfortable enough in a position where I, I was going to break away and I started my own Japanese corporation back in 1990, I believe, or 91. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 95 or 996, and had a lot of companies owned by foreigners in Japan. It was difficult to uh, have a company uh, in Japan. There were a lot of rules. It was difficult to understand how to form a, form a company at that time. Getting investors in your company. I, I don't think if I didn't speak Japanese uh, fluently, and I didn't understand the culture and have the experiences that I did with a lot of people there, that I would have had people invest in me or trust me to start a company that would hope to make them money. Well, but I was fortunate enough to have that opportunity to be able to rent an office uh, and not have that same problem I had when I was trying to rent a, a, an apartment. Um, I had people that trusted me at that, at that time, and all the connections that I was able to make initially going with, in, in, in Japan and through Asia, and even those connections from that interview that got me to Japan, that company I, I, reviewed, I, I, I declined their offer from Nate, was still there in Japan and still someone who were a resource for me and someone I could turn to, people I could turn to help me develop my business career going forward. Other great resources uh, at that time for people doing business in Japan or looking to go to Japan, Jetro, uh, J-E-T-R-O is the acronym, uh, was a great resource. There was other there was other trade fairs that were specifically for Japanese speakers and people interested in Japan. You could definitely take part in those things. But for me in Japan, that was um, um, only my own company and really further my language uh, abilities. Now, I was working with people, other company presidents, I was working with other people throughout Japan and looking at new businesses to do in Japan. Some of those businesses that I started on were after the Kobe, Kobe earthquake in Japan in 1992 or so, 91, houses uh, were in shortage and, and houses from the United States were being built in a different way uh, than house, houses in Japan. And Japanese started looking at bringing housing from the United States, actually broken down into pieces. We build them here, break them down, bring them in containers to Japan, bring American carpenters to Japan to help Japanese carpenters learn how to build American-style houses, which were better 
uh, at that time for uh, earthquakes and other things that were going on. And um, that became one business that I got, uh, did a little bit of. We started with imported clothing and imported hand clothing, which was popular at the time in Japan. But both of these businesses kind of um, didn't work out as well as I thought I, uh, as they would. And I kind of moved into uh, software and um, software licensing. And that became a business done at that point that still today I still do. And with software, things like uh, movies, movie rights, movies licensing, that everything needs localization. Everything needs to be translated from English to Japanese or Japanese back to English. Sometimes voiceover and on those things are required. Sometimes, uh, well, definitely rank contracts, um, other types of business relationships, and uh, uh, business uh, contractual type stuff, subtitling, localization, that, all of that is part of what started at that point in Japan and still continue to do uh, today here in Los Angeles, where I'm located now for the past uh, 11 years. Um, some of the big differences between today and, and back then, we have Skype, we have ways to do business with people that we did not have back then. Um, here's a way, Japanese do business very face-to-face. -face. Uh, for times when I lived in Japan, I said, can't we just do this on the phone? It would be so quick and easy. And the answer is no. You, you go out, you get on a train, you go to your house, you sit face-to-face -face so you conduct business. Now, um, we do a lot of face-to-face -face stuff just like this. I, I don't have to travel to Japan as much. I don't have to be in Japan to do the business. Um, uh, Skype, Facebook, uh, and other ways to become great business will still do things face-to-face, -face, but not necessarily be on site. Um, um, we still do here. I do, uh, I've do. done some translating for Danish Japanese who come for uh, um, things for work here in the States. Ken Watanabe from The Last Samurai. I translated for him during the uh, Grammy Awards uh, a few years back. I translated for uh, Tatsuo Lumania, who's a, a popular uh, uh, actor in Japan, and several Japanese models have come into town as well to work uh, translating for them as well. Um, I uh, was basically what I want to say other than just a quick couple of points uh, um, and a summary of, of things. Uh, I, I think it's really important for anybody who's going to use language. One, business alone nowadays. I think it's a business degree alone is, is not enough, and I also think language alone is not enough. That's why business combined with language, I think, was a big benefit for me, and I think for employers looking at that, there were a lot of kids who studied Japanese together with me when I was there. They uh, wound up in Japan as English teachers, and I think that was a big waste for a lot of those guys, because a lot of them spoke Japanese really well, and just wind up in Japan with no other skills other than a little bit of Japanese language, and, and, and teaching English, uh, I thought, was was unfortunate for some of those people. I, I didn't want to be um, go down that same road. So um, really immersing in the culture um, for Japanese, find something that you like, music, movies, whatever. If, if uh, you're a guy, you like Japanese girls, that's one word for out too. You have a girlfriend or a Japanese <laughs> boyfriend, which is um, you're going to wind up talking like a girl if you, if you, if you learn from girls. It's not, not, <laughs> not like a girl. You, you can learn from a girl, but in the Japanese language, uh, there's big differences between male and female talking, and I recommend uh, uh, not just making that their only way of learning uh, the language. <laughs> um, Non-spoken Japanese, uh, again, you got to be older, you got to make friends, you've got to spend time outside of the classroom and textbook. Because what you learn in the, it, and that's not to take away from what you learn in the classroom, you have to, in the class, you learn from there, going to be important stuff uh, and it's the basis because when you go to business meetings in Japan, that's what you're going to talk about. You're going to talk about, you're going to talk about, that. you're going to talk in business in formal Japanese. When you're with friends and other people, you got to break out of that and be able to use more of a, of a personalized Japanese. Um, finally, keep your connections um, with people on campus. I stayed in touch with Professor, Professor Morty uh, now for uh, over 20 years. I'm very glad that connection still. Um, Professor Mikura and, and, and Professor McGloin, I, I haven't had as much contact with, but the connections you make there in college with, with people, the connections you make on those job interviews that seem too good, the connections you make anywhere. Uh, it's stay organized, keep them all. So one day, somebody you met somewhere in that chain is going to know somebody or do something, and somewhere or another, you see that you're still working hard at your language and learning a culture, and you're going to get, if the payback's going to come, they're going to help you. Somebody's going to reach out to help you, and that's one thing I found, in, at least in Asia, I could say, in most countries, you show an interest for that culture and for that country and, and for their environment and respect for it. You don't come in there with a pompous, I'm better than you type of attitude. You show respect. 
you're going to get that for most people. And, and you try hard, you work hard, and you assimilate to the culture. And, and I think, uh, um, I hope for, for many of you that, that there's a bright uh, future and a long future with your foreign language the business in that particular uh, country. So, uh, and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. All right. Thank you, Steve. Are we good or do you need to adjust anything? I think we're good. Okay. Okay, so next I'd like to turn it over to Mia Johnson. Uh, Mia graduated in 2010 with degrees in economics and international studies and has since worked and lived in three different countries and one territory. She now lives permanently in France and works as an active travel guide, and that's where she is joining us from. So thank you, Mia, for staying up late to be with us. Um, and please join me in welcoming Well, thank you, Michael, and the Language Institute for holding this event. And thank you, Steve, for that really detailed explanation. I can now imagine you in a chicken suit, which is just great. <laughs> Um, so as Michael said, my name is Mia Johnson. I originally come from Duluth, Minnesota. I went to the UW between 2007 and 2010 is when I graduated. Studied economics and international studies. But on the side, that's where I had my second love, which is languages. Um, I studied Spanish in high school and continued that as I went to college. Um, it's something that I really enjoyed. And I enjoyed it because uh, you're able to speak with such a wide array of people in many different countries. Also in freshman year is when I decided to pick up another language to kind of diversify myself. That's why I decided to break into Slavic languages by studying Russian. And again, I found this a way to uh, associate with a wide range of people and be able to study or understand slightly other languages such as Polish, Slovakian, Croatian, etc. So it's kind of neat by learning one, I can speak with lots of different cultures. Uh, so from there, around 2009, when I was about to graduate, that's when I kind of had this panic attack about what was I going to do, and I kept getting the question, what are your plans after college? Um, and I really didn't have much guidance being a first-generation college student. So what I did, um, you guys might be experiencing this soon if you're a senior almost, or maybe you're thinking about it even as a freshman. Uh, what I did in order to start to think about how I'm going to win college to the real world is I sought out professionals, uh, advisors, mentors, people on campus, professors uh, that I really admired and that I wanted to be in their position one day or I thought that they would have good advice. So I went and talked to them and I asked them, how did you get to the position where you are? Or I asked them, if you could go back and do something different, what would you do? Or what piece of advice do you have for me after all these years of working? After talking to uh, at least five or three and the pattern that I kept getting was go out and travel or use the languages that you've been studying and do it now because the opportunities to do it in your future will be a lot less. Now is the time to do it. Uh, most of us don't have families after graduating college. Uh, most of us are not married. And this is the time that we can move about. This is the most global time in our life. It's the time to get out there and use what we've been studying in college. Uh, so that's what I did, and I really took their advice to heart. Um, so what I did is I utilized one of the programs on uh, Madison's, Madison's campus, ISEC. And that's a French acronym. It's spelled A-I-E-S-E-C. It's an international student-run program that essentially does internship exchanges. It's in over 110 countries all over the world. And it's run by students who raise internships in their local chapters and then exchange students. So I have been working for the Madison chapter for two years when my graduation came up and I decided to use the program and I went abroad to Russia. I had been studying Russian and my goal after graduating was using what I had been studying economics and international studies and language to go abroad. So um, from the middle of nowhere, from Duluth, Minnesota <laughs> to Siberia. Uh, so I lived in Novosibirsk for three months, which I don't know if you know Russia that well, it's above Mongolia and China, where they kind of come together there, and Kazakhstan too. So I was very lucky meeting from there. A 12-hour time zone, time zone difference. So I was really on the other side of the world. Um, and that's where I started to push myself out of my comfort zone, and that's where I really started to learn more about myself. That's the life lessons that I'll hopefully be able to communicate to you. 
So, uh, so for my background purposes, I went from Russia, I was there for three months, and I worked as a, in a social business company. I worked, uh, I helped send Russian entrepreneurs to Europe and the US in order to expand their business. So like Steve, I did some translating, um, I did some communicating with clients and kind of prepared them for American culture and what to expect, and, you know, prepared them for the cities that they were going to. Uh, from there, I then went and did a six week vacation in France and England. I was with my boyfriend who's French. Um, and then at that time, I really thought, I don't want to go back to the US. I actually hadn't gotten the return ticket back to the US when I went to Russia. I was determined not to come back and I wanted to keep exploring the world. Uh, so, what I did is um, actually, I had some and an email popped up one day, and it was from the Isaac organization. And there was an opportunity to become a business analyst in Puerto Rico for a year. And so I applied and thankfully got the position. I was really interested in it because it was a mix of studying economics and studying statistics, and I was able to use my Spanish. So it was a perfect opportunity. And I then left, went home for 10 days, and took off to Puerto Rico. So that's where I lived all of last year working as a business analyst. Um, during that time, things changed a lot for me, though. My boyfriend proposed to me, and we agreed that uh, we would settle in France and live here permanently. So unfortunately, I had to turn down my first salary job offer. Um, it was really hard to do, <laughs> but uh, it was a good choice in the end. So around January of this year, I moved once again to France. So now that's where I am right now, in Lyon, France. I've been living here for 11 months so far, and um, I'm now, as Michael said, an adventure tour guide in France. So I lead tours on bicycles that last a week long, and we tour all of southern France. I've been in Brittany and Normandy, seen the Normandy beaches. I travel all over, and a lot of times I know more about France than the French do. <laughs> so, um, what I haven't lived in the US since graduating, uh, I can definitely give you two examples of languages and how they give me an advantage in the professional world. So, while I haven't used them in the US, I am assuming what I've learned abroad it can be applied to the U.S. also. So my first example was when I was living in Puerto Rico. Uh, when I arrived, my Spanish was really not fantastic, and it kind of stayed that way for a while because it's a bilingual island. Um, as you know, they're part of the U.S. Uh, so I arrived, and I wasn't using Spanish at all, and I knew it wasn't going to improve. And one day I decided I'm going to do an entire month in Spanish. I'm going to try my best and force all my coworkers to speak to me in Spanish. I'm not going to answer them unless they do. So I started doing that. And then at that point, I really started to notice a difference in the way my co coworkers treated me. Um, speaking their language connected me on a different level with them, and I gained a lot of their respect, especially in comparison with other employees that were coming from mainland US. Uh, my boss noted it often in my quarterly evaluation, saying my Spanish was improving, and it meant a lot to the company, and that it, with my Spanish, you could see me progressing within the company because I was going to become bilingual, and that was very useful to them, and I was able to commu communicate with the credit companies that they were working with in the mainland U.S., and also work with the employees in uh, Puerto Rico. So that was great, and actually it helped me to the job offer that I eventually had to turn down. Uh, also, a little side note, I worked as a waitress in Puerto Rico, uh, and there was a huge difference uh, in comparison, when you walk up to a table and you start speaking Spanish, or you walk up to a table and you start with English. So those are just the things I noticed uh, using Spanish in Puerto Rico, was the difference in respect that you got when you speak to somebody in their native language, or um, if you suddenly just assume that you're going to speak English. Um, so another example I have is actually when I arrived here in France. I didn't know any French before arriving here, uh, and thankfully, Studying Spanish and studying Russian kind of opened the door for learning French. Uh, what I learned from studying Spanish and Russian is I was able to make mistakes. I was able to kind of make a fool of myself and laugh at myself and learn that the goal is not at first to be uh, speaking perfectly, but to be understood. So this helped me really uh, learn French and learn it quickly, um, which helped in return with my job in the States that I slowly started to get here in France. Um, when the job that I actually ended up getting, I mainly got it, my biggest advantage, 
was known as French cuisine in Spanish. So there was a lot of Americans that came over or other Europeans from Eastern Europe that came for this job interview. And because they didn't know French and because they didn't know Spanish, where a lot of our trips are, they were not able to, they weren't hired. They didn't have that advantage. So, and now I can, with my job, speaking French with subcontractors and speaking French in front of the guests that I'm leading these wonderful trips for, really gains a lot of respect. Again, um, it shows that I'm qualified and credible to the guests. And you can also, uh, if you speak French with two they tend to be a little bit nicer towards you. <laughs> so it helps me out a lot in that respect. Um, and I also was talking to my husband earlier today, who's French. Um, and his thoughts on this, he comes from the business world, and he's bilingual in English and French also, and he knows Spanish too. Um, he said it's extremely important in international business uh, to be able to speak with somebody in their native language, or you know, if you're buying, um, if your company is multinational, for instance, it can be very important if you deal with the French branch and you do business in French. Especially coming from an American, this is a big deal. Um, there's kind of the stereotype around the world that Americans only know English, and we tend not to go beyond that. Um, additionally, culture goes along with language. Even if you are just beginning to learn a language or you don't speak perfectly yet, starting to learn the culture with the language, sometimes uh, this can speak louder than words. So if you're just beginning to learn a language, start learning the culture with it. Like Steve said, go out and make friends from the same culture. Um, an example I have is when I was in Costa Rica, the first place I went abroad when I was 15. My Spanish was terrible. Um, but I remember the first thing I did with my host mother to really start communicating with her was to learn how to dance salsa. And that you probably need any words for, but you can instantly connect with um, somebody from a Latin culture if you know how to you know, move the way they do. Uh, so the conclusion I have from all my travels and all the languages I've studied is uh, the languages have given me courage and bravery, and in return has given me a lot of respect in the professional world. I've kind of moved all over, and that can you know, be a little iffy on a CV, but the moment you say, you know, I moved to this country and I learned this new language in such a short time and I got this respect, that can be a huge advantage and can be a huge um, flag for employers looking for somebody bilingual. Um, advice for you, uh, take advantage and enjoy college. This is a time, there's so many resources, so many connections on the campus, like Steve said. Um, my specific advice, this one I got from Wendy Johnson at the Language Institute, is learn one language really well and master it, and kind of stick with it and really learn to love it. Um, if you can, if you say you're bilingual, it's going to a job interview and they test you, hopefully you're, you're really bilingual, because they're, they're going to catch you if you tend to fudge it a little bit on your CV. Uh, use your resources on campus. You won't find many resources like them in the professional world. Uh, take it from me, moving into a new country, not being part of a university, or having many clubs here in France, it's really hard to meet people. It's really hard to uh, meet people your age and break into the professional world. So use those resources on campus, like the one I was talking about, ISIC, for instance, to get abroad and to use your languages. Uh, additionally, specialize in something in addition to your language, so you're more multifaceted. Steve, for instance, did business in Japanese. I did economics and you know a couple other languages. And this really helps because it makes sense why you're applying for a certain job, and then your languages add on to your resume. Um, and also, really think on what you want to do after graduation, and go out and do it. Like I was saying before, this is the time in your life to be mobile. Uh, get out and if you want to be a scuba dive instructor in the Bahamas, go and do it now. This is the time do it in kind of time to explore and figure out what you want to do and use the languages that you've been studying. So I hope you've learned a little bit from my interesting and very varied experiences. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, and um, last but not least, we'll hear from our one non-remote presenter. Um, Jillian Bao is a 2008 graduate from UW with degrees in economics and Russian. She is currently a senior consultant in the transfer pricing practice at Ernst & Young LLP in Chicago, where she assists multinational companies in developing international business strategies to optimize effective tax rates. So please join me in welcoming Jillian.
Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I um, really appreciate it. It's so fun being back here. I got my nails done red yesterday, so I was really looking forward to Madison. So thanks again. Um, my experiences are um, admittedly probably boring compared to theirs and a lot more domestic, but I think my story and my experiences will still resonate with some of you. So um, hopefully that's the case, and I'll just give you a little bit of background about where I come from. Um, I'm from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, originally. I came here in 2004, and I started at UW as uh, an international studies major. I'm a little bit ADD, and I have a hard time focusing, and when I was an international studies major, I kept um, gravitating towards my Russian classes and towards my econ classes. So eventually, I just dropped the international studies major and went with Russian and economics. Um, a lot of people were really confused by that because they thought I was a Russian economics major, and so I got a lot of funny looks, like, oh, they teach that? <laughs> um, but the, the combination has, has really paid off. I liked it a lot in school because my Russian major, my Russian major and my Russian colleagues, it, it became like a family, really. Uh, we, we met, you know, five days and then three days. And so I saw the same people throughout you know, my college career and the TAs that I was with would host us at their homes. Um, it was really great, still in touch with them. And then the econ side, I kind of got that Big Ten pit experience where you have the more like anonymous feel going on, which can be really great at times too. Um, so for that, I'm very thankful that I went to a huge university like UW and got the family side and, and the big econ side. Um, so I graduated in 2008, horrible time to graduate, really, really bad. Um, it, it's still not great, but it's looking better than 2008. And I work in, in business and can see things really picking up. Um, on the consulting side, you kind of see things you know, before, and then you're a little bit removed because clients engage you to do work before things fall. Um, so to me, that's like very encouraging. Um, so I graduated in 2008, and uh, I was interviewing a lot through the business service, business BSC, um, BC. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I don't know if, if it's still the same. BCC. BCC, BCC, yes. Um, I was in letters and science, but we could do a passport program. And so I submitted my resume to any companies that were looking for econ majors. Um, so I, I did apply for jobs with more of my econ major in mind, but I found that my Russian major was kind of like the gift that kept on giving. Like, I applied for so many jobs with really impressive companies, and although I didn't get offers from all of them, I got to interview with quite a few, and I do think that I was selected because I had Russian on my resume. I think that because every interview I went to, um, people would ask about my Russian. You know, like it was just something that stood up, stood out on my resume and made me unique. And for that, I got some really neat experiences. Even if they didn't materialize, I got to um, meet some really impressive business people. So um, eventually, I, I had an offer in 2008 with a great multinational company. And um, I didn't take it because it was in Rochester, Minnesota, and at the time I, I really wanted to be in like Milwaukee or Chicago. Um, that's a bad move. Since we're recording this, I'll go on record and say if you have a good offer from a multinational company, I would take it and not turn it down and expect something to turn up. Fortunately for me, um, I worked as a paralegal for a year, and then Ernst & Young called me back and they said, yeah, you know, we're looking for that Russian-speaking econ major that we talked to a year ago. And so they remembered me because of the Russian on my resume. And so they called, um, and they ended up getting the offer that time when I went back. And now in the work that I do, so I, I work in a field called transfer pricing. Um, is anyone familiar with transfer pricing, or have you heard the concept? A little bit? OK. So what we do is we um, analyze intercompany transactions, tangible flows, intangible flows, service flows, and financial transactions. And we analyze them to um, ensure that they are at an arm's length uh, rate, essentially, because when you transfer tangibles and services and loans, things like that, it's very easy to arbitrarily place profits in a way that's tax beneficial. 
Right, so I mean your sales to one subsidiary become a cost for you and a top line item for them. So you're decreasing one company's uh, taxable income while increasing the other. So obviously these things are scrutinized extremely heavily. Um, you may see articles in the paper, Google, Apple, they always come up with like, they use a very common like tax strategy. It's like, uh, this is more the structuring side, but it's something like the double Dutch Irish sandwich, double Irish Dutch sandwich. Um, anyways, what drives that though is transfer pricing, and that's how they, how they price their intercompany flows. Um, so with that, it, it, it's just fascinating to me. Every couple of weeks, there's an email that goes out and says, does anybody have language skills in X? Because the client has engaged us to do um, a project that includes, that includes that company, and they need someone who can go over and take notes and at least interact on a business level so that you know, we have more credibility as a firm. Uh, recently, I just got put on an engagement which involves um, a very big, top 10 consumer good company headquartered here uh, with a subsidiary in Russia. It's a licensing transaction, um, so we'll have a royalty flow coming into the U.S. And um, I was selected for that engagement because of my Russian skills. And it's a really cool engagement. So um, I said Russian just is kind of a gift that keeps giving. Um, so I, I guess that's my main, my main point is that really Although I wasn't immersed in it as, as much as Steve and Mia, I think that just having the experience and having it on my resume and realizing all of, like, just how marketable it really is um, can do a lot for your future. So, and if anybody wants to learn more about transfer pricing, I have my business cards here. It's a really, really growing field because, I mean, all the companies are, are multinational now, and so, there are countless flows that go in between companies, and it's one of the fields that they actively recruit, like a little quant, quant plus language majors. Um, it's a very, very international group. I work with a woman from Dubai, a woman from Russia. Um, my counselor is Dutch. Um, you name it, we have people there. So that's really it. And if you have questions during our Q&A session, I'm thrilled to answer. Okay. Um, so, like I said, now we have time for questions. So, if you have questions for anyone um, on the panel, feel free to just raise your hand and stand up. And yeah, go ahead. How would you market your language skills for a position in the United States that doesn't really have an international market? Okay, so the question is, how would you market your language skills for a position in the U.S. that may not have an international market or international focus. Would you like me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I, if I understand the question correctly, I think one of the things I mentioned during my speech was my first opportunity came from a company based in the United States. They happened to be a Japanese company. They were based in the United States and they required people to help them with that language. I, I would imagine obviously any multinational company is certainly a target. Uh, but if not, let's say that it's a small company, and 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 uh, if your company, if your question means, what do I do with the company or in an environment that doesn't have that international side, and you're still got language, well, offer to to see if they make a product. How can your language help them access that market? Um, how can things you know about from that culture that you know help them benefit internally in that company? There, there's probably other ways to, to apply your language skills. When you bring a language into, into a business environment, you're bringing more than just for your whole different cultural understanding, especially if you're speaking the language at that level. And for those kids, maybe there's other ways you can help the company. Certainly opening a new market would be, uh, would, for, that, for that company would, would probably be the biggest benefit you could provide, in my opinion. Europe, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree. If you are looking for a multinational company, then of course your languages are going to help out and really give you an advantage on your CV. But perhaps you get an offer from a smaller company. Um, don't think that your languages are not useful still. Uh, like Steve said, you're bringing in a whole new culture and a whole new level of understanding that a lot of people who haven't studied languages, they don't have that. Uh, one example I can give is I worked for a small economics consulting firm in Madison. 
and it had four or five employees. So it was very small. Uh, but what's interesting is my boss is actually interested in learning French in order to expand abroad to Canada. So it's actually more relevant than you think to study languages like French and Spanish if you're considering working in the U.S. or even a smaller company. Um, I, I, I agree with what they say. Um, and also I think it, you can't really underestimate how, how impressive a language is on, on your resume. Um, I know people that work at McKinsey and you know, the other consulting firms that were language majors. And when you have a language on your resume, it sends a message that you're flexible, that you have a global outlook, and, and that you can adapt to different situations. And I think all of those qualities are very attractive to employers. So again, I, I just don't think you can, you know, just don't underestimate it. Okay. Um, uh, I'm wondering, like, you were mentioning and you were saying, like, is the language going to help in the resume? And, like, how do I really, like, express it? Like, do I just merely mention it? Or, like, how do I express it? So the question is, how do you um, express your language skills on, on a resume or a cover letter or other format? Uh, I guess I'll start with that too. Uh, well, again, uh, if you're approaching a multinational company, um, they certainly have speakers of the language you speak as well. Make a cover letter in both languages. Make half the cover letter in English, make half the letter in Japanese. Make a separate cover letter in Japanese. If you get a Japanese style resume, research how it's done. Do a Japanese style resume on top of your English resume. I think you'll come to people and, and, uh, and, and, and get that your resume up in the pile over other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're going for a more traditional outlook, uh, what I do with my CVs is actually make a section, which is becoming more popular now, with you can put your computer skills, uh, you can put your hobbies, and then put your language skills. Uh, this is, tends to be a more European format of the resume, but it's also good to take a little section and to highlight your language skills, which are becoming more and more relevant to candidates in the job market today. Um. When I was applying to jobs, I was really applying to big consulting firms, and they get hundreds of resumes, right? And, and now I'm in charge of recruiting for my group um, at Ernst & Young, and unfortunately, it's true what they say. You get a stack of resumes, you look at it, if you see, th so if you see something you like, you put it aside, you know, and then you keep sifting through, and then you go, you'll sift through again. So for me, I just put economics and Russian right on the top, so that, you know, it would catch somebody's eye. And if they saw it and they saw you know, econ, and then they saw an econ and Russian major, you'll probably give a little bit more attention to the one that has a language in addition. So really, um, I just put it at the top of your resume and top of your cover letter. And if I can add, um, come and see me or another advisor on campus, because that's what I help students to do. Um, so I have some cards up front if you want to press them. Um, yeah, question. Uh, did any of you attend a study abroad program during the uh, college? Or uh, if yes, like how did it help you? If not, do um, you have any suggestions about it? Okay, so the question is did you uh, attend a study abroad program when you were in school? And um, how do you feel that that helped you? And do you have any suggestions for the students here related to that? Uh, I guess I'll start again. I did not attend a study abroad program. Uh, maybe I wish I did. I sat in that big picture hall that first year. All the kids who did come back from those abroad programs, they already had a really good base in, on Japanese that I didn't have. Um, if you have the opportunity, great, take it. But um, if you're going to take an opportunity like that, go there. Serious about, again, I, I think I heard immerse. Immerse yourself in the culture. It's so easy. One of the things that we have to we need to have so many Japanese friends in Wisconsin is because some of the Japanese friends congregated together. They were there. They were here. To, they were in Madison for English, but they're all staying put together. Uh, the same thing is true. You see Americans go over to Japan, and they're all in a group of people who speak English. Well, they're never going to learn Japanese if they're sitting there with all English speakers. So break up, go to the mission, go there with with the goal to come back and say, you know what, I'm going to get ahead in Japanese now by a semester um, or move for by, by, if you do that, the opportunity, if not, 
Well, like I said, do the best you can in Madison. You, you've got lots of lots of culture around you there. Meet some friends. Do what you can. Learn it there, and and and, and you won't be far. Um, I want to like Steve. I didn't do a study abroad program, mainly because I was only at the UW for three years, and at that time I didn't have means to pay for it. I was also kind of a determined individual in the sense of I knew there was something out there that was a different experience, a little less expensive, and I wouldn't be going with a large group of Americans because I wanted to go abroad and kind of get that cultural experience. And what I've been seeing from my friends is that they often stuck people from university and didn't really immerse themselves. So I was looking for, for an opportunity to kind of put myself out of the, outside my comfort zone. Um, and that opportunity was actually, I lived in Croatia for three months after my freshman year of college. Uh, kind of out of the nowhere, like out of the blue, I found it online and I worked abroad in northern Croatia at an international summer camp for kids. So yes, while I was speaking English, um, I also learned a lot and a lot of people from around the world. And actually used my Russian a little bit because we had a lot of Russian students and a lot of Russian co-counselors that I was working with and I could understand basic Croatian. Um, so my advice to you is the study abroad, study abroad program at the UW are amazing and you can go to some very unique places. But I would suggest maybe picking up that I looking into the smaller programs or combining going abroad with a work experience. So you can kind of gain some work experience with your language experience. Um, so really kind of find the fit for you and don't go with the crowd. Uh, don't necessarily go abroad to Spain because all the other Spanish speakers that you know in your class are going abroad to Spain. Maybe push yourself, go to Chile, go to Argentina, um, or do some volunteer work abroad. There's all different types of opportunities. Um, do a little plug for the organization I worked for. There's also us the Gone Campus, which has both short-term and long-term internships all over. So there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, study abroad is a great one. But if you can't afford that one or you're looking for something different, there's plenty out there. I also didn't do a study abroad program. Um, I wish I, I would have had the opportunity to, but my parents said, well, we'll pay for four years, anything over that, you're on your own. And because I switched a little late from international studies, um, I did have some catch up to do, especially with the math stuff. Um, so I didn't, but I, I had friends, I have a lot of friends that have had amazing experiences. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. It was a, um, it, she's a Japanese major, so it was sort of a question for you, but I think the, the broader question is um, for students who have, you know, language experience and study abroad experience, but maybe don't have the other side, like they don't have a business major or they don't have econ, um, and maybe they don't want to just go and teach English or whatever. Um, what what sort of advice could you give? Um, could any of could any of you give to for sort of next steps for them? Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, that, that does make sense. And uh, well, um, you know, I made a point before about a lot of kids is uh, you know study Japanese and a lot of in Japan just teaching English, and, and it sounds like that's not some the same course you want to follow. Uh, and if that's the case, I. You know, I, I guess if you have time still in school, you try to get a couple of business type classes in, economics type classes in, something outside of the language and culture side, something a little more tangible in the sense of like like a business or marketing or something. I don't know what options you have there, but I think that would be a big help. The second thing, I, I think, you know, speak Japanese now um, and you read Japanese now, you know, start reading some Japanese newspapers, start reading, there's books that, that the presidents of Matsushita and, and Mitsubishi and, and, and other big Japanese trading companies wrote books. They're not big books, they're, they're, they're not that difficult. You're, you're con you'll definitely move after, after uh, reading them. I'm sure Mori Sensei will, 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 will can help you a little bit with that as well. But uh, I learned a lot from books. They gave me business background and knowledge too. But, uh, try to take some class, try to volunteer a company maybe uh, if you can, somewhere in Madison that, that has that, that little bit of this other type of background other than just the language, and I think it opens you up to more opportunity and just being a language major. 
Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with Steve. Uh, in any case, if you're focused in language, you definitely should pick up something else to kind of bring to the table when you have these job interviews, um, unless you're looking to really dive into Japanese literature or Japanese culture and end up teaching that, for instance. Um, so like you said, take the summer class, or if you're coming to graduation time and you feel like graduating leaving UW, take a short class at a community college, for instance, maybe in biology or economics, business, something else, and see what kind of uh, what kind of gets you going, what you have a passion for outside that language, and then what you can do is find a company in that field in the country that you want to go to. I think another thing to keep in mind is you know, any multinational company that you can get an in with here, um, regardless of what, what it is exactly, but if you can get in and you have a special skill set, chances are that they will find something for you. I mean, with Ernst, you know, I never started there thinking like, oh, this would be a great opportunity to go to Russia. Well, Russia just passed um, new transfer pricing rules for documentation requirements. If I said something tomorrow, they would probably get me there in two weeks. So to the extent that you know there's you know, a multinational company out there and that they have opportunities in Japan, just get in with them. Even if it's not you know, the perfect fit at first, it's amazing um, just how you can navigate within them once you get the, your, your contacts and your network going. And you can come and see me too if you want. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Um, so I know someone, she works for um, Kimberly Clark. It's a big company in Wisconsin that makes consumer products. Um, and she's an engineer. And she goes to South America, Central America a lot, um, does research for her products. Uh, but she doesn't speak any Spanish or Portuguese or anything. So she has like translators from a hired company that go with her. And they just, like when she's doing her research or whatever, they just like simply translate like what's going on. And, um, so they're obviously like hired from a company, you know, like employed from a different company other than Kimberly Clark um, to do that. Um, and I tried reaching out to her and asking her if she knew like what company does that or what company that Kimberly Clark hires to hire people to go with her. Um, and she didn't know. Um, are there, and I tried Googling things like this, like translation companies, or like multinational translation companies. And when you Google something like that, you just get basically no good information. Um, so I was just kind of wondering, do you know of any good companies where like, maybe you could start doing something like that, where you get hired and you travel with people and you simply translate and you can build your skills and I mean you also are going to be able to travel obviously a lot of places within your skill set. Um, are there any really good companies for something like that? Did you guys get that? Oh. It was a, it was a, a question about um, sort of how, how to get into the field of translating, like translating for other companies, um, is that yeah. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, if you jump, I, I, and I got thrown into it, uh, didn't really plan on it because that's just how it went up for me. But something I noticed recently is that, that uh, LinkedIn has these tons of groups, or I mean, I, I look at Japanese related stuff, but people are translators people who want to be translators, people who have translated and talk about their experiences and different things to watch out for in translating. And I'm sure if there's Japanese on there, there's probably twice as many for, for I don't know if it's Spanish or, uh, or uh, were you saying Spanish? Yeah. Yeah, so I would imagine there's quadruple, at least that of many different types of groups. Just go with the LinkedIn and start looking translate, Spanish translators. You'll be shocked at how many different people are discussing different topics and people on there who are current translators who actually seem to be giving information out to help people like you to become a translator one day. So uh, maybe one good resource for you. Okay. My boyfriend works for um, a hedge fund and they do almost 100% international investment and they travel with people like that all the time. So I don't know them offhand, but if you give them, if you give me your email address, I can reach out to him and see if he knows because he deals with that all the time. Mia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just to add, the best way to probably break into those translation services is just getting connections, such as from LinkedIn, such as talking to Jillian right here, and kind of networking yourself and 
who knows who and kind of break into those companies. Um, otherwise, spend a bit of time online and keep on searching. That's how I actually found a couple of my opportunities. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is it common for companies to kind of help you maintain your language uh, once they hire you, or is it kind of up to you to um, just make sure that it's up to par for when they need it? Sure. The question was, um, is it common for companies to help you maintain your language um, after you've been hired, or is it sort of up to you to do that? Um, my experience has been that's, that's up to you. Um, by, by being in the company, by being in culture, you're, you're, you've got to get better at, at the language. If you don't, you're not. You're just not trying enough. I mean, you're there. You're in. You're surrounded by people in the company. The company, my company, never offered me the opportunity to better my Japanese, uh, but they did offer me the opportunity to make extra money help other people. I can turn that. That's a great kind of back end of things. Uh, um, and, and, but. No, uh, my experience was not that way, um, at least for the meat to smaller size companies that I worked for. Uh, and I, and I found at the end of the day, there was, I was soaking up so much stuff, those of being all day long. Uh, it, it really, you're going to get better. It's a environment. You, you, you're, you're just naturally going to get better at the language. Mm -hmm. My experience is, especially with the small companies, not a lot of them are going to give you the resources from the company, especially if it costs them any money, to continue studying the language. Um, just because there's so many people out there nowadays that are bilingual or three languages, four languages. So in order for you to be competitive, learning the language really does have to come from the inside out. You have to spend time doing it. And in return, that makes uh, your language is so much more valuable when they're on a TV. A company sees that, that you put time into it, and if you can prove that you're bilingual, that's a huge indicator that you're motivated and you have initiative to teach yourself something and to really learn something new that can be valuable to a company. My company um, does. Um, if I wanted to take Russian classes to stay up on it, um, they would reimburse me for at least a percentage of it as long as, you know, in these consulting firms, if you can make a business case for something, they'll, they'll let you go with it. Um, and they also have so many different rotational programs. Um, problem is a lot of people go on rotation, then they like it and they stay there. And so, <laughs> yeah, they limit them somewhat. But, um, yeah, I mean, in a company like Ernst & Young, it would be really easy to maintain it. Yeah. Sorry, I have another question. Um, is there like a universal test or like a, um, a good way of indicating on your resume, like with a test of some sort, that you are proficient at some level that like a lot of companies would recognize? Because um, I know there are different tests out there and some people have told me that different companies like go through different tests. Um, so I was just wondering, is there like a good universal test that you could take, you know, to certify on your resume that you are at some proficient level? Um, the, did you guys hear that? Yeah, I, I don't know what the test is called in Jap Japanese, but there's definitely different level Japanese uh, proficiency tests. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I actually never took those exams, um, um, but I, on LinkedIn, where I told you before to go look, you'll see those people, those translators, uh, things will definitely be talking about those different proficiency exams for the language you're talking about and the required levels for their, for their different, uh, you know, for the different type of work that people are doing. Um, you'll have to probably check that for your individual language, but I know Japanese definitely ha ha has it. Yeah, it definitely varies language to language. Uh, my experience with French is uh, what you can do is contact the government. Uh, so I went to Alliance Française, which is a government organization here to teach French. And turns out there does exist uh, three different tests to take to qualify your prof proficiency in French. And I imagine this exists for other languages. Uh, Spanish, it might be harder because there's so many different countries. But what you can do is kind of start by looking into the governmental organizations and seeing if they have a standardized test. I don't have anything to add there. Yeah. Um, would they suggest taking a test like before you know, like putting it on your resume, like while you're applying, like before you like taking it now, or do you suggest waiting until a company like requires you to take it? Did you guys hear that? 
Oh. The question was, um, would you suggest taking the test now while they're in school or sort of waiting until you're applying to a certain company or? Uh, boy, I, I, uh, you got a lot of tests in school already, you know, I mean, focus <laughs> on what you need to give in yet. Focus on that. Uh, I think this is something you can get out. You get your feet wet a little bit. Get into the culture. Get into the place that you want. It may not be your first job. may not be the one you're going to be at for the rest of your life. But that's the time for you to spend some of that extra time practicing more of the language, getting more comfortable uh, with it, and then taking that proficiency exam. For the Japanese speakers in there, I just looked it up. It's called the JLPT, Japanese Language Proficiency Test. Um, uh, and again, I'm other languages are similar, but that, I don't know, my opinion would be focus focus on your school stuff, get, get your good grades, get your resume built up good with the stuff you're doing in school, break out, and then look, if you've got a job that requires you to have this type of, I mean, I speak Japanese pretty good, I, I read and write pretty good, I, I think better than probably a, a lot of people, but I've never taken this test, so somebody would sit next to me and say, well, you speak Japanese good, what level do you want to test? I don't, so I didn't take and, and I probably never will. Uh, but for some types of work, um, I can see where they're going to ask you this right off the bat. How fluent are you? Tell us your, your, your test result or tell us your level on this proficiency test. So depending on the work, it, it could be really important. But I, I would wait a little bit. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily something vital. Uh, it's always good to have on those extra certificates or proof that you have further interest in the language if you took the test. That's another good indicator on your CV. Um, I don't think it's something you need, though, until you're asked by a company. Um, sometimes companies have their own levels within the organization, too. For instance, my company did a language test at the job interview and then based you as minimal, conversant, or fluent on their own terms. Um, so that can happen to you also. My biggest word of advice is just uh, if you there's something you can put on your resume, you can put minimal, you can conversationally fluent or fluent. Um, whatever you put, just when you go to a job interview, be prepared to be tested. Yeah. Uh, I'm a freshman and I'm taking first semester Japanese. So when the time I made up my mind to take Japanese, I never thought about take it as a major. So what's the difference uh, of if I take it as a major uh, between if I just take it as uh, uh, electives? Uh, and if um, I do not get a degree on Japanese, what can I write on my resume to show that I have some kind of ability in Japanese? Okay. A little trouble, please. Sure. The, the question is about um, how would you, what would you say is the difference between like having a major in Japanese or another language and studying that language but maybe not majoring in it? Well, I, I didn't major in it. Um, you know, my, my business was my focus always was. Um, I supplemented business with the Japanese and with international business and, and, and the other things I spoke about already. I, uh, I, um, you know, again, I, my point, I think what I was trying to make was from my perspective that a language major alone, I don't I don't know the attractiveness to uh, a lot of business environments, to a lot of jobs. If you just go in there saying, I speak Japanese fluently, or, you know, or I speak Chinese fluently. Well, there's a lot of people speak Japanese fluently, there's a lot of people speak Chinese fluently, and or any other language. But you're coming in with the ability to speak that language and have an accounting or, or economics understanding, or politics, or something else that, that something that I, I mean, that for me it was always the language was slightly below the business side of things. I wanted the business down, I wanted the language to supplement. Then my resume, yeah, I'm a BBA from the University of Wisconsin, you know, I'm focused in, you know, Japanese studies, Japanese religion, Japanese language, and, and for me that, that seemed to work, work out okay. Uh, what I did when I was studying Russian is I actually went to the department and asked them what was the advantage of having Russian as a major versus just studying Russian as a language. Uh, the difference with the Russian degree at the university when I was there um, was a Russian major was more focused on literature and uh, eventually preparing you to go on to a master's or PhD level. And so what you, I recommend that you do 
to go talk to the department and kind of see what advantages you can get from having a major over just uh, studies language as a supplementary uh, area. I think really it depends on you. If you really enjoy your Japanese classes and you want more of them and it's something that just drives you and you get really into it, go ahead and major in it. Um, if it's something that you're just, it's more of a hobby, it's not as important as other things, then there's no issue at all with putting your major and then right under it I would put, you know, also took X semesters of Japanese because like I said, when you do get these resumes, something like that is really going to pop out. So I don't think there's a huge difference between majoring in and studying it, but, you know, it's, it's nice to kind of, I, I like the Russian major just because it kind of became like my little family at UW. That's up to me, and yeah, and both of you who are asking about how to talk about language on your resume, you can come and talk to me about that too. So I think there are four or five people that should be. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Anyone else? Okay, well, please, if you haven't signed in, please do so and take a minute to fill out the little survey. Um, and Thank you, all of our panelists, for being here. Please.